I'm Leah Forster, and I'm happy to welcome you to this Beverly Community Council lunch on the important topic of suicide awareness and prevention. Suicide is a public health issue that can be at the forefront of our attention while also remaining mysterious. It grabs headlines with shows like 13 Reasons Why, yet when a client, a colleague, or a loved one is struggling with suicidal thoughts, many of us are at a loss of what to do or how to help. Additionally, what about the many people suffering in silence who we do not know personally? What actions can we take to encourage people to come out of the darkness, seek help, and know that they are not alone? It is a true challenge to do justice to a topic like suicide prevention in the short amount of time we have today. So consider the next hour a short introduction. This afternoon we'll hear from organizations and individuals. Oh, sorry. This afternoon, we will hear from organizations and individuals who are already doing important work in our community to prevent suicide. You will leave today with some concrete tools, awareness of resources, and a roadmap for further exploration. Today, our panelists are Whitney Bowditch, LMHC. Wendy is the assessment coordinator for the North Shore Academy in Beverly and a psychotherapist in private practice. She's also an instructor in mental health first aid a national program to teach the skills to respond to the signs of mental illness and substance use. And we have Lauren Goblinski, the Director of Community Education and Outreach for Samaritans. And I will uh, give it over to Wendy. Okay. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so as she said, I work at the North Shore Academy, which is um, um, a middle high school therapeutic program. So my career has really been focused on youth and teenagers, and my private practice the same. So I'm going to speak a little bit to the youth, because there is increasing numbers, but I also recognize in the audience there's we're spanning the whole generations, um, many, many generations. But in my work also as an instructor, we're really trying to, through the mental health first aid or youth mental health first aid, which is my, there's various levels and I'll talk a little bit about that, but really trying to give people anybody who has any interaction with anyone who has increasing levels of mental health and potential signs of suicide the tools and understanding and information you need to just be able to one not be afraid of it two to kind of respond in a way that's just compassionate thoughtful and be a listener and then also be able to respond and then get them to the right services kind of like with regular first aid has anybody in here ever taken a first aid CPR course so nobody's training you to be a doctor or a paramedic but we're, you're just training them to sort of hold on until professional help can, can come so <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that the numbers are rising yes Lauren so I'll, t I'll give you a little stat it's sort of alarming so right now um, between the ages of 15 and 34, suicide is the second leading cause of death. It's a pretty significant um, stat and only second to like accidental deaths. And the rise, there are significant rising numbers in mental health. For kids these days, significant mental health disorders are one in five. So what is it, about the same in adults, if not a little bit more? It is the same in adults. And it used to be the third leading cause of death for ages Yes, and now it just went up, yep. And in the last couple of years moved up to be the second leading cause of death. So the numbers are not going down. They're not going down, they're going up. Um, and we could talk a lot about, well, that's a whole other training. We could talk a lot about kind of the reasons why, but I think the point is we're recognizing today that the, the increase in mental health is increasing the levels of suicide. So I think today the focus is really like, how can we increase our awareness? What are some of the signs? Um, how can we talk about that? And then how can we respond? And I think Lauren and I might just sort of feed off each other a little bit on that. And I'll talk about the mental health first aid program that I'm an instructor for and how you guys can get involved if you want to do that. Because I think it can supplement what some of you already bring to the table as well as spread the wealth to anybody you might know. Because it's really geared towards anybody, anywhere. You don't have to be a professional. You just have to be somebody who has, who knows a kid, raises a kid, has a kid in your neighborhood, is an aunt, is an uncle, that kind of thing. Um, so. I'm somebody who doesn't like to talk at people. Can we have a discussion? What do, what do people have in your sort of experience, knowledge, thoughts? What are some of the signs that people are aware of about potential suicide or thoughts of suicide? Somebody who might be thinking about that? Yeah. I was just saying, you might want to restate what we say to make sure that they can. Okay, yeah. So. I would say people disengaging from um, like, their social networks. People disengaging from their social networks, yes. Other thoughts? Signs of suicide? Decreased appetite. Yes. Erratic, strange behavior. Erratic, strange, yeah. Impulsive. Drinking more. 
Increased drinking or substances. Yep, alcohol, absolutely. Depression. Depression, yep, and everything that comes with that. So isolation, withdrawal, hopelessness. Other signs, think of kids, because that's going to look a little different than adults. So I want you to think of a typical adolescent and what that might look like exacerbated. <laughs> that's a difficult thing. So typical kids are like what? Moody, agitated, irritable, angry sometimes. They might sort of pull away, but it's the that in excess. And their risk-taking behaviors takes an excessive turn. Or their um, moods are quick or multiple all the time in every part of their life. And so that's the significant thing to remember is when you begin to see erratic or major shifts in all the areas of their life, that's when you begin to get worried. And simply talking about death and dying, people actually talking about I want to die or life without them. Teachers often catch this because kids start to talk about, and they're even colleges too, I imagine. We have some representatives from colleges. So people talking about writing about death and dying. Um, giving away their prized possessions. Were you going to say, what were you going to say? That was going to say? Or putting their affairs in order. Um, so these, one of the other things that people don't realize because they actually think it is hopeful, but it's kind of a major, major sign, is when somebody's been pervasively depressed for a long time, talking to people about, you know, maybe potentially thinking of death or dying, and then suddenly they seem really good. And people are like, oh, Jenny's back. No, sometimes that's a sign that they finally made the decision that they're going to go through with their plan. And that's when you should be worried. Okay? So those are all signs and symptoms. Uh, and I think it's pretty similar between adults and kids in terms of those major signs. So these are things to pay attention to. Um, would you add anything to that, Lauren? Yeah, I was just going to say. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Fake microphone. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say that with the warning signs, it's not going to just going to be one or two of these warning signs, and it's not just going to be one or two of these things happening overnight or within even a couple days. It's going to be after two weeks or more period of time. And the best way to think about warning signs is what I try and describe when I'm in the classroom is to kids that defining depression means when someone feels sad or hopeless for two weeks or more period of time. Because then a new thought process and pattern has started to develop where they feel like it's, it's not gonna get better. I'm not gonna be okay, what's the point of living? And those warning signs is how those thoughts are coming out. So if you're seeing somewhere between two to five of those warning signs and it's changes in what you've known about someone. So the way that I try and explain this to kids too is that, you know, adolescents, just like to sleep. That's just who they are. That's what they do. They just love to sleep. But if we're noticing that they are not wanting to ever get out of bed, that they're never wanting to bathe, that they're not caring about their hygiene, that they're not caring about themselves, that's those thoughts of hopelessness and helplessness, those feelings of giving up on them, themselves that are starting to come out and now it's lasting over just one or two days where they just want to sleep it's two weeks or more, well, that's out of the norm, right? So that's how you want to kind of think about it of, you know, it just being aware of, well, you're not sleeping one or two days. Are you suicidal? Right? So, so trying to just put into context, if they're not sleeping, if they're giving up on their grades, if someone's not coming to meetings, if someone's isolating themselves, if they're not participating in clubs, hobbies, sports, things they usually like to do, and that all those things we're starting to put together, that's when we really want to be aware of that, that the red flags are starting to go off in our head. And the way I like to highlight it to just sort of simplify it is to think about our live, love, laugh, learn, so you know that little hokey phrase that we all think about, but how does it affect somebody's ability to live, whatever that means, as adults to function in their life, to love their relationships, to laugh, to enjoy their activities, and to learn. So that might be school or to remember things. So the more of those, all those areas it impacts, the greater the risk. So that's when we're looking at when it becomes diagnostically something significant. But these signs too, I don't want there to be two weeks of I feel like I want to die though. So when kids, when kids or adults are saying, I'm feeling like I want to kill myself, this is not a two-week period. This is right now. It's a crisis. So that's the only thing, distinction, I think, when we're talking about suicide. But we're talking about the signs that lead up to it in terms of depression. Um, 
The one thing, too, that wasn't brought up that I think is important that often comes up is self-injury. Have people had experience with that or know people who've engaged in self-injurious behaviors? What are some of the things that people have, have had or know about? The cutting? Cutting. 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 What else is self-injurious amongst adult, uh, anybody who's having those difficulties? Um, I remember cutting a while back, like, choking until you pass out. Choking until you pass out, yep. Yep. Burning. Yep. And I, I, I probably could argue that a lot of the substance abuse related um, behaviors are self injurious. Eating disorders. eating, eating disorders, those kind of things can be self injurious. Um, I think it's important to know that those are, those are one of those signs of increasing risky behaviors, but not necessarily a direct link to suicide. In fact, this is going to sound maybe a little bit weird, but we think of injur self injurious as a coping mechanism, not a healthy one, let's be clear, not a healthy one, but one of those things that somebody might engage in to reduce or to bring back those symptoms that are, that are difficult for them to manage. But it's not a direct thing, it still requires a response, it's still a concerning symptom. Does that make sense? Okay, a lot of nods, good. <laughs> um, and obviously when we're talking about suicide and major mental health issues, we want to be in, engaged in talking about risk factors. Do people know what the one most significant risk factor is when we're talking about mental health and suicide? Say that again? Accessibility. Accessibility to? Like weapons or, yeah. Yep, means to do it, yep. What are some of the other risk factors that can increase somebody's potential to? A plan. Yes, having made previous attempts, yes, themselves and know somebody or in their family that has. So, yeah, their own mental illness. Yep, definitely. Well, accessibility is the, creates the highest risk, definitely. But then the family members in their own thing, yep. The, the risk factor that can contribute to high levels of mental health and suicide is also trauma. Trauma is a big factor to just think about. But the sort of the, the risk level comes down to the other things. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what we do in the mental health first aid training because this is a community-based resource that's available to people. There's a website. It's called mentalhealthfirstaid.org. There are two modules. There's the adult version and then the youth version. It's an eight-hour course. It's, it's available to everybody from coaches to librarians to parents to professionals if you want to. It's a health-based, it's not sort of clinical. Um, but they also have modules for first responders, veterans, rural, uh, older adults, higher ed. And again, that's really to give people basic tools to be able to respond to these crisis situations. So what I just talked about sort of ex in, in a full effect with action plans and increased awareness. It's a really good course. Um, it's a certificate-based course, and really it's also about reducing stigma and increasing community-based awareness so that anybody who has any kind of interaction with people with mental health issues or kids, as the case may be, can be a participant in reducing the risk levels. Um, I encourage people to it. There are actually federal grants out there that communities, Beverly, could look into getting federal grants to support that as well. That's all on the website. Check it out. I offer at least three a year through my, the North Shore Education Consortium um, that can be available to anybody in the community as well. But I just do the youth one. There are adults out there too. Um, I think part of what we talk about there, you're probably going to get into, Lauren, just in terms of how to respond and how to support people. So I think I'm going to turn it over to you. Sound good? Yeah. All right. Great. There you go. Thank you. And I've actually been trained on the first aid mental health. Um, and it is a really, it's a great training. It's a great training for anyone and everyone, whether clinical or non-clinical. It's just um, really gives a good idea of everything. Mm -hmm. I'm actually just going to stand over here so I can go through this slide deck and then everyone can um, get a view of hopefully not having chocolate on my face. <laughs> um, so I also just want to bring up a point when we were talking about risk factors, and this really lends itself to the destigmatization of mental health, depression, and suicide, that, you know, the way that the news reports suicide or mental health is that they'll say, 
oh, this student was being bullied, so they took their life by suicide. Like, that was the cause, and that was the effect from it. Is bullying a risk factor? Yes, it is. Is social media a risk factor? Absolutely. Cyberbullying, all of that. But was that the only reason why someone took their life? No, it wasn't. There is a multitude of risk factors that may happen in someone's life that can lead them to feeling isolated, alone, and hopeless. And so the Samaritans is really there to exist, to be an organization to let people know from a public health perspective, so non-clinical point of view, that the idea of just being in the moment with someone to say you don't have to do this by yourself. There are people out there who want to help you, who are willing to help you 24 hours a day. Whether that's someone who's struggling with um, identity issues, whether that's someone who's struggling with financial struggles or financial loss or relationship issues or having someone that's just passed away or their own mental health struggles, we have our helpline to help someone with those things because um, I, I provided resources on wherever the resource table is now, somewhere here. Um, so the Samaritans is a suicide prevention nonprofit. And so I come from our office in downtown Boston. Um, but the number that we provide is the, actually the statewide helpline. So anybody can call our helpline. It's all free. It's anonymous and it's confidential. The people who answer those calls are volunteers. Those volunteers are 15 years and older. So we have um, people that have been volunteering with us for over 40 years. And then we have teens that volunteer with us to fulfill community service hours. And we actually have a lot of college students as well that volunteer with us. So really spans um, the life, life cycle. And the reason for that is, you know, people say, well, how can a 15 year old help someone who is suicidal? Well, A, less than 1% of the calls that we get are people that are suicidal, less than 1%. So 99% of the people that are reaching out to us just want someone to listen to them, just want to feel heard, want to feel understood, and want to feel like they matter and they're important. Because when people are feeling suicidal, it's not that they actually want to die. It's that they want to not live with an excruciating amount of pain anymore and suffering and despair and isolation. And that's really what it comes down to is people feeling like maybe they've talked to their friends, they've talked to their family, and they just feel like maybe those folks aren't really helping them or um, they just want to not burden those people, so they'll call us. Whatever the reason might be, 24 hours a day, people can call us. It doesn't matter. At the end of every single phone call, we say, or text, we say, call us back anytime we're always here. So the people who answer our calls, I said, are volunteers. They do one shift a week for four hours. Teens that volunteer with us do one shift a week for three hours from six to nine um, or on the weekends. And, you know, our job is to listen compassionately, non judgmentally, and give active listening to say, we're in the moment with you. So, I'm going to go into that a little bit more, but I just want to tell you about our other services too, because most people only know us for our 24-hour um, helpline number. The other thing is that we have the prevention services. So I'm, I'm the director really of our prevention program. So my job is to go into middle schools and high schools across the state for free. I go into, um, we're in all the high schools in Boston Public Schools. And then I actually go to um, Miles River Middle School in Hamilton Wynnum. Um, I'll be in Canton tomorrow. Um, I, you know, so I'm, I'm really all over the state basically. And I go into the classroom and I give a curriculum to students and teach them about suicide prevention, how they shouldn't keep a secret, why it's okay to talk about this, why we should be having these conversations and letting them know it's okay. It's okay to be upset. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to feel alone, that you don't have to do that by yourself. That's really, at the end of the day, what people want is to feel that they're not alone, is to feel like they belong in some way, shape, or form, and they have someone there to listen to them. That's our whole mantra and mission of the Samaritans. And we do that right down to our post pension services, which is for grief support. And so for grief support, those are for survivors of suicide. So a survivor of suicide is someone who's lost a loved one to suicide. And so we provide um, meetings that are called safe place meetings and they're all around the state and they're for anyone who's lost someone to suicide that wants to just come and talk about what their loss has been. People can come 
a week later. People can come seven years later. People can come 20 years later. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if that was a colleague. It doesn't matter if that was a teammate, if that was a friend of a friend, a family member, whoever it might be. It's open to anyone that has somehow lost a person to suicide in their life. So um, I just want to very quickly touch upon what we were saying earlier about both the psychiatric disorders and the, the stats of suicide. So um, that, you know, we talked about how suicide is a second leading cause of death. The number of suicides per year in the U.S. have grown every single year over year by at least about 1,000 or 1,500. There's four times more deaths by suicides than there are homicides in Massachusetts. Two times more deaths by suicides than there are car accidents in Massachusetts. But would anyone know that? By raise of hands, would you know that? And why don't we know that? Because we don't want to talk about it, right? Because we don't want to have the conversations. Now, granted, me and Mindy are probably a very small handful of people going around talking about suicide every day. So fair. I understand that. But just because we don't talk about it doesn't mean it's not happening. That leads to the stigma. That leads to the isolation. What we try and teach people is you don't have to be a mental health professional to help someone who is struggling. Yes, we want to make sure that we're getting them to a certain point, like with Mindy's program of the first aid and what we're doing, so then we can get them to the mental health professionals who are capable. But being able to recognize the warning signs, making sure we're educated on the risk factors, making sure we know, yes, it is okay to talk about it, and yes, we should be talking about it because this is real and it happens. And the only way for kids in our society to know that they're not alone is to open up the conversation. Is it easy? No. Is it awkward? Yes. Does it feel like it's intrusive? Yep. But does that make those feelings go away for someone? No. So we have to be direct, we have to be honest, and we have to come at it from a place of compassion and non-judgmental listening in order to be able to get them to those professionals. That's where the Samaritan's standpoint really is. So um, the, these things that, that I talked about is that, you know, with the suicidal feelings, it's complex. A lot of people are, are feeling things at um, the same time of they might be depressed. Now, the thing that I want to just point out too is because someone's depressed doesn't mean that they'll be suicidal because other mental health disorders could be anxiety, PTSD, bipolar, schizophrenic. That doesn't mean that because someone has anxiety, they're going to be suicidal either, but it does put them at higher risk. So, you know, we think about 13 reasons why that cluster effect, right? 13 reasons why was my life. I don't know about you last spring when it came out. Um, and so there's that, that cluster, that effect, right? But there's a vulnerability level of the youth that people have an innate will to live. And in order to override that will to live, suicide has to be an acceptable outcome in their mind. So there's probably a deeper mental health issue going on that maybe we just don't know is existing yet or is showing itself by those warning signs. So again, why we should really make sure that we're having these conversations. So. Um, a lot of the things that we try and that I try and teach to people when I'm in the classrooms is, and, and when I, I also do gatekeeper training, so I do um, staff trainings for um, police, for emergency services, for, a ton, I do a lot with schools, um, is teaching people about how can you internally and externally help yourself when you're in those moments of crisis, whether that's suicide, whether that's depression, or whether that's that you're just getting picked on and you're having a downward spiral in your mind. So internally, listening to music, um, reading a book, um, doing yoga, meditation, exercising, going for a run, right? Those are all those internal coping skills. But external is what are things that you can be a part of, groups that you can be a part of that make you feel included, that make you feel like you're working towards something else. So maybe that's a sports team, maybe that's a club, maybe that's a hobby that you participate with other people, but something like that to make sure that, that um, you know, kids are, are being inclusive. And I always teach kids about, you know, why it's so important of inclusive, inclusive, people being included, um, <laughs> inclusive, uh, so that they don't feel alone. Um, because some of the other risk factors is, you know, 
Um, L- anybody who it, who identifies as LGBTQ have a two to seven times higher suicide rate. The statistics have shown that a lot of that um, feelings of suicide has come from family or friends who will judge them for what or who they are. Um, and so, you know, again, it's, it's everyone has their own different stories and it's just a matter of how can we try and understand people's experiences, backgrounds, lives to say, wow, how much stronger can we be together and how much smarter can we be together by trying to learn and understand. So coming back to what I was talking about before of what people want when they're feeling like they're struggling. So. At the end of a long day, maybe you've just had, you know, a a bad day, you had a long commute into work, you were late for a meeting, you had a, um, you know, bad um, call with a client or something, just one thing after another, right? And you come home and you're speaking to your spouse and you're like, oh, I just had a really long day. And they're like, oh, you're fine. That's not that big a deal. Get over it. It'll blow over. How often does that happen? And how does that make us feel when we hear that? Not heard? Like they don't care. Like they don't care. Invalidated, right? So what we teach our volunteers is what we call rewiring the brain. So instead of saying, oh, that's just stupid high school stuff. You'll get over it. Ah, you're only 14. Relationships come and go. There's plenty of people out there. Because that's what kids how they tend to speak to each other right so instead we're always trying to weave that empathy piece in how can I understand where someone else is coming from not what my experience is not how I would deal with it how are they dealing with it because everyone has their own different levels of stress their own experiences in life that has happened that we may or may not know about and trying to understand well let me think about this not from how I feel but how from they feel so wow it sounds like you had a really hard day Tell me more about that. Did anything happen that might be contributing to these feelings? Does anyone else know that you're feeling like this? I'm so glad that you're coming to me and you're talking to me about this because I can't imagine what this has felt like for you on your own. So praising people for being vulnerable, getting on their level, trying to ask open-ended questions to open up the conversation. So instead of saying, are you okay? Saying, how are you doing? What do you want to talk about today? How can I help you? So with the Samaritans, when we open up a conversation, um, say someone was to text us and it's 10 PM and they, um, I, it comes in on a computer to us and I say, hi, my name is Lauren. Thanks so much for reaching out. Would you like to share your name? And that person can say, no, I don't really feel comfortable telling you my name. And we'll say, okay, that's perfectly fine what can I help you with today? Or what, what brings you to reaching out to us today? What do you want to talk about? And we give people the floor and we just let them talk about whatever it is. And in that first phone call, maybe they're going to talk about the weather. Maybe they're going to talk about how it was sunny out when they were driving here, but it was also snowing at the same time. And that's confusing. Um, you know, because we know that people aren't just going to be vulnerable with us right off the bat. Even though we know maybe they're upset and it might feel frustrating for us, knowing that again, It takes a lot for someone to really open up about what they're going through and holding that compassion, continuing to check in on people and not just saying, oh, you're fine. Okay, great. And moving on to the next subject, but saying, if there is anything going on that you want to talk about, I hope you know you can always come to me. I hope you know I'm always an ear because again, people just want to feel like someone cares about them. Those hopelessness, that helplessness feeling, those feelings of I'm a burden on everyone, that no one cares about me. Just by saying, hey, I hear you. I'm listening to you. It sounds like you're really upset. Maybe you're not ready to talk about it right now. That's okay. But if and when you are, I'm here and I'm not going to go anywhere. And continuing to check in on people is also really important. On the flip side of that too, when you think about someone who's lost a loved one to suicide or has lost a loved one in general and they're in their grief, it can feel really hard to know what to say and to know how to handle those situations. But the same thing goes of just, listen, I can't imagine what you're going through right now. I know this must be so incredibly difficult for you. To be honest, I don't know what the right thing is to say, but I do want you to know that 
I know there are hard times ahead. I know you're having hard times right now. And if you ever need someone to talk to at any point, I hope you know I'm right here. That is powerful for people because oftentimes when people are struggling, whether it's with a mental illness, whether it's a mental health struggle, or whether it's with grief or loss, they do want to know that someone just cares about them and they don't necessarily want to have to explain it when they don't feel comfortable with it. We got to give them time to feel comfortable and that comes with being compassionate, being non-judgmental, and being open to listening instead of saying, what we also teach our volunteers is not to give advice. So, well, why don't you do this? Well, why don't you try that? Well, have you talked to this person? Well, what about doing that? As humans, we're fixers, right? We want to fix it. We want the problem to be solved. We want to say, oh, okay, here's a bandaid. Here you go. Put a little pretty bow on it, right? With these real life struggles, that's just not how it works. And that's a really hard thing to sit with, right? To know, well, I don't have control over the fact that this person passed away in your life. I don't have control over the fact that you struggle with depression. What I do have control over is how I can support you. So what can I do to be here for you? How can I help you? What do you need from me? How can I just be a good friend to you? Those are all really valuable statements to someone who's struggling with anything that's going on in their life. And then I'll just, um, you know, really wrap it up with being really direct when you're asking this question. Um, people are afraid of this question and that's normal because you automatically think, well, what are they going to say? Well, their life is going to be in my hands. Well, so how do I, what do I, what do I, right? And I'd love to hear what you're, if you want to add to this, that just because we don't ask it doesn't mean they're not feeling it. So we have to ask it and we have to be direct with it. So what... And just because you ask it doesn't mean you're putting a thought in their head. Right. Believe me. They're thinking it, they've already had it, and, and oftentimes it's a relief to see that they can actually say yes. Mm -hmm. People and thank they're us. okay with accepting that, even though you might not. Because none of us are. Even the therapists, I ask this all the time, and it happens inevitably a Friday afternoon at about three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, here it is, and we have to deal with it. But that there's relief that somebody's now going to hold it, and we're going to figure this out together. Sorry, and we're going to figure this out together. So I think it is it asking the question very specifically because there's a million ways you can say, "Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you you look like you're not okay? Do you need something? You're not doing all right, are you?" And then you don't go there when that's really the question you need to ask to really assess the level of risk you're at in the moment. Because people want you to ask this. They want you to be direct. They feel relief after you ask this because you're saying to that person, I'm not afraid to meet you where you're at in your pain. That is huge for people because for them, they feel this huge weight on their shoulders, this burden, this, this big black cloud over their head of this feeling, but they're so afraid of that judgment if they say it or someone else freaking out if they do say it. So being really calm, what you can do is say, are you having thoughts of hurting yourself or have you hurt yourself as a lead up question, but you cannot ask it instead of, are you feeling suicidal? Or, are you having thoughts of suicide? Are you having thoughts of killing yourself? I know how scary that can be, but exactly like what you were talking about with the cutting and that the cutting, the self harm, the hurting yourself, is a coping mechanism with pain that isn't necessarily targeted to suicide, right? So when we're come, talking about suicide, we want to be really direct and really honest and really aware of how we're asking it of, you're not suicidal, are you? You're not going to kill yourself, right? Because that's basically saying, if you are, not your person, don't come to me, right? Turn right around. Is that, listen, I'm really worried about you. I've seen some things lately that are concerning for me and calling those out are okay of, you know, whatever they might be. And I wanna check in with you. Are you feeling so bad that you might be having thoughts of suicide? Or I'm hearing you say that you don't wanna be here anymore or no one would miss you if you were gone or you feel like what's the point of living or you hate your life. Those are really serious statements to say and scary and heavy statements to say, you're human. It's okay to acknowledge those things. Let yourself be human in those moments. You don't have to have the right answer. It's not your job at that point to say, oh my God, this person's life, I have to save their life right now. What you do is you have to stay with them 
and not leave them alone. And then you have to go to the next person with them. So whether that's a therapist, whether that's a doctor, whether that's calling 911, and you're taking certain steps of, have you thought about when you're going to do it? Have you thought about how you're going to do it? And have you thought about with what you're going to do? Those are the things that make up a plan, where, when, how. If they are saying yes to all three of those things, you're calling 911 right away, no ifs, ands, or buts. They might be mad. They might lose their mind. They might do all these things. Your job is to help save their life at that point. What we always do is part of our safety planning is, does anyone else know that you've been feeling like this? Do you have other protective factors, barriers, people in your life, support networks, brothers, sisters, parents, aunts, uncles, whoever it might be, um, to be part of this. Do you want to add to this? No, you're doing fine. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Um, so just let yourself be human, but know what kind of resources you have available to you. So for example, in Boston, we use the best team. Um, advocates is something you can use. Um, mobile crisis up here. Mobile crisis up here. Um, of course, 911, obviously. The only time that we break confidentiality at Samaritans is when we have risk, ass risk assessed. We've asked all those questions. Then we're finding out where they are and we're getting them help sent to their house or wherever they are right away. We're calling the police, we're tracking down their number, and we're making sure that we're getting help sent. We will say, is it okay? if we get help sent. Most of the time, the answer is yes, because again, they don't want to die. And at this point, we've really done everything we can to build the relationship and the trust with them to know we're really there to help save their life. Because, you know, it's, it's tricky working with kids that they feel like, you just want to get me sent hospitalized or, you know, all these things. It's, it's that we want you to be okay. And that's really what this comes down to. Can I introduce you? Yeah. Um, so I think that with kids, it is really that you want to always come back to my job is to keep you safe, no matter what your role. But I also like to say kind of stay in your role is my thing. Stay in your lane, stay in your role, whatever that might be, um, no matter in that situation. So remember, multi if I asked you what your main, many roles were with people in your world or just kids, you're a parent, you're a husband, you're a wife, you're a grandparent, you're an aunt, you're an uncle, you might be a teacher, you might be a coach, you might be a church leader, you also might be a, you know, a clinician. So in that situation, you have to stay in your role so the person knows what to expect from you. That's really key with kids. They need to know what your role is and you need to stay in that so it doesn't get complicated and you don't get confused because if you get confused then all bets are off and then nobody knows which way they're going to go so that's really important when you're working with somebody who's in crisis to stay in your role and then pull in other people who can fulfill those other roles um, and that keeps things a little less icky too with kids, for lack of better words do you want to just touch on the transparency factor of being transparent with people Trans, about what, yeah, so I think, it, especially with kids, because I'll say this out loud, they're the biggest bullshit readers, they, radars, they, ha, they know, they know if you're bullshitting or if you're real, if you're genuine, but like, I think it's really good to be transparent in terms of, I want, my job right now is to keep you safe, and we're going to make a plan to do that, and here's what we're going to do, and here's what I need your help with, and whether it's an adult with like, we need to call somebody, who's your person, or we need to, with a kid, I'll be like, yep, we're going to call mobile crisis, but we're also going to call a parent, and let's do that together. So there's a transparency about your plan. There's not some hidden emergency, you know, transport vehicle that's going to sneak up, and they're going to come in and wheel you out. So that's scary, because that makes the situation even scarier. And, and, that, and then your trust is gone. You'll never be the person they go to again. But to be real and upfront and clear about this is about safety, and we will not negotiate on that. But the rest of it involving them in the problem of how to keep them safe, because guess what? They just told you because they don't want to die. Your point made. They don't want to die. They want, they've, they've divulged this information because they want your help. But at that point, getting them help is the key thing. And even if, it, if it's a colleague, you know, going to your supervisor, just not holding that on your shoulders and not keeping it to yourself. If you ever hear things and in your gut think, it just isn't sitting right with me, I'm just not feeling comfortable, have a conversation with them. And if they don't react, go to the supervisor and say, listen, I will go with you to do this. You don't have to be this in this alone. Because that's, again, you're just, you're, it's that compassion. You're saying, no, really, I'm not just going to be like, oh, you're suicidal. Okay, here you go. Here's the next person, right? 
you're, we're not passing the buck. And, and that's a, a lot of, from the Samaritan's point of view, is people will say, well, you know, will you just send them off to different resources? No, because we're not there to pass the buck. We're there to say, no, we're in the moment with you. And if you need us in your time of despair, then we're, we're right here, right? If people ask us for different resources, then we will give it to them. But that's what helps build the trust, is to say, I'm not going anywhere, but I am here to help you. And here's what the steps are going to be to get you help um, because once you you lose that trust it's going to be a very different um, situation so that's really kind of our take on how we handle situations what you know people really want to hear from us when they're struggling with anything um, people don't just all of a sudden become depressed or become suicidal um, there's a lot of different risk factors and situations that happen in someone's life. That can be issues going on at home, that can be stress from school, relationship, friendship issues, bullying, I hear, uh, I, I know you do, of all those things. So, you know, kind of trying to, to get away from, oh, it's just this one thing, it's just this one thing. If we solve that one thing, everything will be fine. It's really a multitude of a, buff, a bunch of different things. So giving kids the, or whoever that place to peel back that onion, to talk about all the different things that might be contributing, and then go starting at the bottom to build back up, that's what's really the most helpful points for people. So um, I'll, I'll open it up to the, the questions for you folks. Okay, so the question is, in this situation where you have a very close relationship with your students, but it's not a clinical one, um, but they often confide in you, which is a million different roles in high schools, um, that should you be asking the question? And I think if you're in a crisis situation, yes. Um, if you have the opportunity in the relationship which you can do a warm handoff, which I like to call them warm handoffs where you can see, you know what, Jenny, I actually have this counselor down the, st down the hallway that I want to introduce you to because I think that you guys can, you can still come in my office and we're still going to vent, but I actually think you could use her too. That's a nice way to sort of be like, I think she's getting into an area where I can't support her any longer and it takes me out of my lane. But I think if you're in a situation where she's losing, her, really losing it, is in a serious crisis situation and you, she's come in and maybe she's showing you these significant signs or a parent has called you whatever and you're in the moment you might want to ask the question and then that gives you a okay now we're actually walking down to the office of the counselor together and then does that make sense yeah okay yeah I do want to just add something too that most of the time and this comes up a lot when I do my trainings I'm not sure with you people say does it asks about the signs. Most of the time, and I think it's out of four out of the five times that somebody actually does die by suicide, that they show signs. Sometimes we don't see them because they're not aware until we look back. It does happen once in a while that you don't and it's out of the blue, but most of the time you will see some sort of these signs. So the higher the awareness, the better. Yep. Okay, so the question is with dealing with underage kids, uh, how do we deal and when are we ob obligated to contact parents? So if a teenager is at risk, um, and I think this is, so if you're in a work situation, you have to figure out who does that in the hierarchy of your situation. But I think if there's ever a risk of suicide, you must be involved in engaging the parent. Uh, at some point in that situation. So sometimes in a school situation, it is if, if they tell me and I'm a teacher, I'm going to contact the counselor who has that relationship who might call them and also be part of getting the access to the other people. Sometimes it's like if it's a coach, it might be the, the assistant, you know, athletic director or something. So sometimes it's that, but you always, it's like if they break their leg, you're going to call the parent, right? So if they're at risk to kill themselves, you need to be in touch with the parent. I think it would be, I think you'd have to sort of assess the situation, the dire nature of it. If they're in conversation telling you they're contemplating it, but they don't have in their hand a situation where they don't come in and say, just overdosed on pills. So if they come in and they say, well, just overdosed on pills because I want to kill, you're calling 911 and then you're calling parents on the way to the ER. But if they're coming in saying, I'm having these thoughts, I have a plan, my parents have a gun at the house and I'm going home tonight, you're not letting them leave your office or wherever you are until parents come in and they've been informed. And the police probably contacted because of the gun. Right, so I think it really depends. If they're coming in, then saying they're depressed and they're overwhelmed and they're contemplating, but there's none of these scary risk factors of 
access to, then you want to talk about how do you contact them. But you're not calling 911, you're not necessarily calling the parents immediately. So you just have to assess the level of risk like you would in a, in a, in a other dangerous situation. But I think, I think you want to err on the side of involving parents if there's any risk of, of hurting themselves. Um, or being in an any risk for crisis, um, for, for suicide. That, that I always err on that. I, I don't think you ever want to not, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Even when saying, don't call my parents. That's probably the time that you most want to, yeah. <laughs> actually, yeah. Yeah. unfortunately, because those are the times that it's, that's when you don't get involved in secrets. Yeah. I will never, ever get involved in secrets. I can't hold secrets, especially if it has to do with your safety. That's kind of my, my, always my rote response. I will never compromise on your safety. I care about you too much. So I won't carry this secret. Yeah. Good question. Good question. So what you're asking is how do you be empathetic and be there for someone who um, doesn't have the same perspective as someone who um, can see things in a bigger picture, that someone who might tend to see things more tunnel vision and be harder for them to get through l smaller things? So it's complicated, right? Because it can be really frustrating, but everyone has their own different levels of what they can and cannot handle. Some people are just built to be able to handle bigger things and let it roll off them a little bit more, and others are not. And again, it's, it's not trying to see it from our point of view because we have the bigger point of, of, of the picture of life, but that you know, maybe there are other factors that have happened in their life that we don't know about that might make the smaller things that much more significant for them. So instead of saying, um, you know, well, I would do this or I would try this, you can say, you know, it sounds like you're really upset about X, Y, and Z. Can you tell me more about what might be contributing to that? Okay. What do you think would be best to help you through this? What can you do to kind of work through these difficult moments? What has happened in the past for you that has been helpful? And let's start from there. Um, you know, I because then if we say things like, you know, I've been through this and it wasn't that bad and I just did this and it was, you know, it was okay. Then again, it goes back to them feeling not heard, feeling judged, and feeling like their stressors are either not important enough or that they, um, it, it makes them feel invalidated, right? And so it can be really hard from the, the standpoint of the supporter, but it's that empathy piece of this isn't about me, this isn't about how I would handle it, it's about how that person would handle it. But furthermore, if we are trying to help people build their resiliency and build that bigger perspective, trying to hold them to that also and hold them accountable to that to say like, okay, I see that you're really struggling. Let's talk about all the different things that might be contributing to that and what are you doing to help yourself? Let's write those things down and how can you utilize those things in your life? Okay, should we check back in? tomorrow, in a couple days, in a couple weeks, again, that compassion piece to say, I'm not going anywhere, but I also want to make sure that you are doing these things to help yourself get through these difficult moments, right? So, so trying to make sure, because sometimes I can also come back to boundaries too, and oh, whatever, a whole, a whole nother spiral, but, um, you know, just if it's too hard for us, at that point, we're kind of building our boundaries. You know, if it's too hard for us to see where they're coming from, we're saying, what are things you can do to help yourself? The compassionate of, I'm still going to check in on you, but I'm also going to keep myself maybe a little bit of a distance too, because it's too hard for me to be able to put myself in your shoes completely. Is that helpful? Does that make sense? You want to add to that? One quick thing. I think when, if I were talking about adult and that whole youth, the mental health first day, they talk a lot about recovery and promoting that in terms of what you encourage adults to understand. And I think with kids, it's sort of building them with resilience, and that's a little bit more skill-based and concrete and black and white. But with adults, it's also like, you know what, there is recovery, this is a difficult moment, I can see how you might be, t but like there is time, it is gonna get better, there is, people do recover, get healthy. So like promoting that can be, without saying, I once was this person, or I know this person who did, like you can just sort of say, you know what, I know this feels difficult, 
difficult, but you can get better. There are there is hope for the future. That's the other thing that we try and promote because that's really true these days. It's gone are the days where you're like, oh, bipolar. Oh, here's some lithium. Good luck with that. Like we're not doing that anymore, right? There is real. There's supports. There's health. There's status. There's stats and data and research and treatment. And that's really true these days, too. Now, the good news is most kids do recover. And most people who are suicidal are not suicidal for the rest of their lives. Um, they have moments or a couple moments, and then they do kind of come out the other side. Yeah. Question is, does being suicidal at one point make you more prone to being suicidal, suicidal later in your life? I don't think that, that the evidence tells us that. Um, I think that because, as I was saying, because you are at one point, it doesn't necessarily be you're going to continually be or be more of later. Mm -hmm. Most people experience at one point and not again. Mm -hmm. um, but, of course, there are people who are chronically depressed right. and have that as part of their mental health disorder, but not necessarily. In, a lot of it comes a lot of it comes down to that if you are feeling suicidal, are you reaching out and asking for help? Are you being, um, or are you accepting help too, so to prevent that happening again? But certainly some people, some people also live with suicidality, which is the thoughts of suicide, but never get to the point where they're actually thinking about a plan too. So um, it's, it's not really a black and white answer, but absolutely 100%, there's a very good chance people could be suicidal at one point or maybe even two points, but if they're getting help and if they're doing all the steps to really be able to improve their lives, then there's a very good chance. Uh, most people do live a really great life afterwards. People, even attempt survivors, people who have attempted to take their life, have lived through it and then have kind of gotten that necessarily, that necessary, I need more coffee, <laughs> <laughs> that necessary help that then they go on to leave good lives. And, and so it's absolutely 100% hope for them, for sure. That's a really good question. Her question was, um, if someone has died by suicide, those feelings of shame, those feelings of guilt, those feelings of um, could I have, should I have, would I have, right? Um, and how do, you, how do you deal with that? So um, I'll tell you all that I got into this work after my brother that was two years older than me died by suicide. And he was 29 years old. And at the time, I was in a completely different life of sales and just totally not in the mental health realm. I didn't know what those signs were. And with suicide grief, period, it's called complicated grief, right? Every loss is traumatic and difficult. But with suicide grief, there is the what didn't I see? How didn't I know? What did I miss? If you don't know, then how would you know? right? If you're not educated on what those warning signs are, and at the end of the day, this is a really difficult statement, but we don't have control over someone else's actions. That's a hard thing to sit with, right? That at the end of the day, we can lead them to the water and we can do everything we can to support them, but they also have to want that support themselves too. And we can't change someone else's actions for that, right? We can try and intervene. We can try and get them help when we're seeing those things. The best thing that we can do is try and understand what people are going through, try and help them, try and to be a support for them, and also try and help ourselves, right, of, of making sure that we are doing everything to take care of ourselves while we're also taking care of other people in whatever relationship situation that might be um, of either dealing with grief or if we're the supporter of someone who might be struggling um, afterwards and making sure that you yourself are getting help, are going to therapy, are, are doing all the necessary things to try and work through all those things. And for me, I took that as a piece of advocation of that really, it, it for me felt, how could I let other people lose someone in their life, a brother, a son, a child, whatever that might be, and not do anything about it? So for me, that was my perspective of just trying to take what I've learned and help other people, other families, friends, whoever, um, work through to try and prevent other suicides happening. Because clearly it needs to be talked about. The education needs to be there because how many other people felt the same way I did of, I didn't know the signs, I didn't know the risk factors, I didn't know all the things that I could have known to help prevent this. Her question was, social media and how do you think that plays into this? How do you think that affects kids? I think that social media can be 
double-sided. It can be a good thing to help people, right? There's positive things that can come from social media. There's, you know, positive accounts that are, you know, uplifting, but then there's also the other side of it that feels very isolating. I talk to kids all the time about social media is a highlight reel. Social media, no one is putting on social media when they have to move out of their house because their parent lost their job and they have to move to a different school. No one is putting on social media about how Friday night they're sitting home and they're doing their homework and they just got put in trouble because they punched their brother in the arm. You're not putting that on social media. You're not putting all these difficult things on social media. You're putting on the things that when you're on vacation and if you got a new outfit and if you're, you know, and that's what I try and teach kids of that because then it's that comparison effect and that's that I'm not good enough and why isn't my life like this and why don't I look like this and, you know, and then there's the social media bullying and especially in middle school and you can definitely speak to this, kids are given cell phones, it seems like now, in middle school. Earlier. <laughs> right? Earlier. Or earlier. But cognitively, their brains are not developed enough to know that what they're saying to people, the consequences those things have, those actions that can come from what they're saying and how that can feel from someone. They don't, they're just not developed enough to realize all the effects from that. So it's, it's, uh, uh, my advice is always to just make sure that parental guidelines are on the social media. You're always watching your kids' accounts. You're making sure you're seeing what they're doing, what they're posting, what kind of interactions there are to make sure that we can be as helpful and supportive as possible. And I know we're running out of time, and I want to talk about that really quickly, and we could talk about this for another half hour, because I think there's actually research coming out that's telling us that the more hours people spend, it's changing this whole youth uh, generation. So what we're seeing is kids are are actually not having as much sex. Woohoo. Not as not getting as pregnant as much. They're home. I don't know if that's good. They're home more, but they're isolated. They're in their rooms. They're online. And they're more depressed and they're more anxious and they're they're having higher suicide rates. Those are connecting now. The other thing is they're more isolated. Their social skills are going down. Their coping skills are going down. The bullying is going up. The harassment is going up. And their access to the, including all of us in this room who have access to technology, your exposure, their exposure, everybody's brain's exposure to the horrific events of everyday life in the entire universe every day is too much for our brains to manage. So guess what happens? Mental health issues and anxiety go up. So it's, 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 there are multiple components of uh, social media and just media in general, the access to the internet that I think is impacting mental health um, of both youth and adults, but I think youth are on it constantly. Uh, so I think that is a big piece of it, that it's increasing the mental health numbers, it's, it's decreasing their ability to organically develop coping skills and their ability to be independently functioning adults. And it won't surprise you that colleges are seeing kids not developed. The developmentally kids are not developing into high functioning adults until later these days. Yes? Yeah. And Dakot, yes, thank you. So that's, I mean, all of this is happening. And um, yeah, I, yeah I, I could go on and on and on. So, but yeah, it's a big deal. It's a great topic for a follow-up thing. We could do a follow-up thing. Yeah, definitely. Good comment. <laughs> Um, so it is 1.30, so I want to wrap up. Um, this, this is a heavy topic, guys, and I thank you all for coming here, but I want to just encourage everybody to take good care of yourselves this afternoon. Um, it's not easy to come and talk about these things, so I give everybody credit for coming here and not, not being afraid. You guys are we're part of the solution, everybody that's here.